Words at War presents The Ship. With half a million men in the Royal Navy, it is inevitable that there should be some coincidence of names and ranks between characters in this book and officers and ratings now serving. That is so inevitable that the author has made no attempt to avoid any such coincidence. All he can do is to assure the reader that he has attempted neither portrait nor caricature of any living person. You'll find that written on one of the front pages of a book I read a few days ago. The Ship by C.S. Forrester. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, brings you another in its series of radio adaptations of great books of this war. Each week at this time, we bring you selected dramatic episodes from some of the most stirring of our war-inspired literature. Tonight's story, The Ship, by C.S. Forrester, eminent English author of Captain Horatio Hornblower and other fine books. Adapted for radio by Edmund Burnbrier. The ship is a glorious yawn about a glorious British vessel and the men aboard her. A novel. Yet as you read it, you feel you're reading facts. It's tough, authentic, gripping, this yawn. I read it and I was excited. I hope you will be too. If the convoy didn't get through, Malta might fall. The convoy had to get through. And there were only these five light cruisers and a dozen destroyers to get it through. The ship, HMS Artemis, was a light cruiser. Masthead, smoke on the starboard bow, green one nine. Masthead, smoke on the starboard bow, green one nine. Some men would have been uncomfortable in the crow's nest. Not so ordinary seaman Harold Quimsby, whose idea of happiness was a full belly and nothing particular to do. Thanks to many hours of practice, Quimsby was able to watch the whole horizon forward of the beam without allowing any of his automatic movements to break into his inner thoughts. He was thinking now of his first sea voyage back in the almost unbelievably distant days of 1939. He'd been up in the crow's nest then, too, he remembered, when his binoculars picked up a dot on the distant surface, and he'd rung down to the bridge with excitement and seasickness. There's uh, something over on the left. Where are you speaking from? The headmast. Oh, I mean the masthead, sir. Then that's what you say first, so that we know down here. And you don't say over on the left, do you? What do you say? Uh, on the port bow, sir. That's right. But it's better to give a bearing. What does your bearing indicator read? Uh, uh, 21, sir. Uh, how do you say it? Uh, I've forgotten, sir. Port is red and starboard is green. Remember that port wine is red, and then you yes. won't forget and the 21 isn't plain enough, is it? Uh, no, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, now, let's have your report. Remember to say where you're speaking from first. Um, 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 Masthead, sir. Object in sight. Red, 2-1. Very good, Princey, but uh, you must say it twice over. You remember being told that. If the guns are firing, we might not hear you the first time. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I mean, uh, aye, aye, sir. He'd been a very green hand at that time, this ordinary seaman, Harold Quinsby. He felt uncomfortable all over again as he remembered it. Now he looked attentively at the horizon, blinked, and looked again with his hand on the buzzer of the voice tube. Four bridge. Yes. Masthead, smoke on the starboard bow, green one nine. Masthead, smoke on the starboard bow, green one nine. 
most of the Marines of the HMS Artemis were now on the bridge. Captain, and torpedo officer, navigating lieutenant, an officer of the watch, and chief yeoman. They stood there unprotected even from the weather. Nothing over their heads and less than shoulder high around them, only the thin plating to keep out the seas when the ship was taking green water over her bows. Death could strike anywhere on that bridge, but then death could strike anywhere in the whole ship, for the plating of which she was constructed was hardly thicker than paper. Even a machine gun bullet could penetrate it if it struck square. The ship was an eggshell armed with sledgehammers. Mosthead reports smoke. Green, one nine, sir. Very good. Chief Yeoman, signal that to the flagship. The captain, replying to his secretary, paymaster, sub-lieutenant James Jerningham, and giving the order to his chief yeoman. So, that's that. Just three words. Spoken quietly to himself by Captain the Honorable Miles Ernest Thornton Harrington York. A man of far fewer words than names. However, the economy of his speech belied the torrent of thoughts that went roaring through his brilliant mind at the first report. The Italian fleet is out in full force. Difficult to tell how many seaworthy battleships they have after Toronto and Matapan. We'll know now. See them with our own eyes. See them all, because Italians never venture out except in fullest possible force. So, that's that. He twisted on his stool and looked round him over the bulging sea. There on the port quarter wallowed the convoy the fat, helpless merchant ships that carried within them the salvation of Malta. Food, new inner tubing for anti-aircraft guns, shells, heavy guns, mountings, and ammunition. The convoy had to get through. And if it were reckless to risk it with such a frail escort, then recklessness must be forgiven. You can see the smoke now, sir. The flagship signal, sir, letter K. Acknowledge the flagship signal, Chief Yeoman. The signal from flagship to port specified that Scheme K would be carried out under the circumstances with moderate wind abaft and the enemy to leeward. The captain had foreseen these tactics, for already open on his knee were the typewritten orders which laid down what each ship should do under Scheme K. Signal's down, sir. 410. 210 revolutions. 410. 210 revolutions. The convoy was executing a wheel to port under full helm. The cruisers were turning more gently and increasing speed. And the destroyers in the advance screen were doubling around. It was a beautiful geometrical movement. Steady, midship. Steady, midship. Then another signal ran to the masthead of the flagship. It fluttered, waiting for acknowledgement, and then went down. Starboard 10, midship. Starboard 10, midship. Four bridge. Ships in sight. Ships inside. Upon getting more complete details from Quimsby aloft, Paymaster Sub-Lieutenant James Jerningham turned to yell the message to the captain. Six big ships, six destroyers. Two leading ships look like battleships. Might be heavy cruisers. Others are light cruisers. The captain figured quickly in his mind that if Quimsby could see them now, the enemy ships would be in sight from the bridge in about four minutes. The voice of the range taker began its chant. Range 210, range 205, range 200. In exactly four minutes, the enemy shot up suddenly over the curve of the world, climbing over it with astonishing speed. Port 15, revolutions for 27 knots. Port 15, revolutions for 27 knots. Visibility was at its best. The enemy ships made hard, sharp silhouettes against the blue and gray background. Paymaster Sub-Lieutenant James Jerningham knew himself to be a coward. But some time ago, he made up his mind to be a coward lacking in nothing. He spent hours in his cabin, carefully studying the pictured profiles of hostile ships. Study carried out in a mood of desperation, of despair. And he had a photographic memory which enabled him to recall the very pages on which he had seen those profiles, even the very print beneath them. The two leading ships are heavy cruisers, Bolzano, sir. 9,000 tons, eight 8-inch eight guns, 32 knots. You're sure? Aren't they... No, sir. And the last three cruisers look like Bandoneri. 
I don't know about the first one, though, sir. She's like nothing we've been told about. I suppose she's the new one, Cadorna. And the intelligence people didn't get her Prothea right. I, uh, I expect you're right. I think I am, sir. Out of 500 who started as naval cadets, only one man ever reached the lofty rank of a Captain R.N. Only a few grades lower than God. That's the thought Jerningham had at that particular moment. It was followed by another that saved him from some of his bitter feeling of inferiority. He, Jerningham, could spot ships better than his captain. It did not mean he respected the captain less, admired him less. He would have admired him even more if he could have read the captain's cool, unflurried mind. Out there, six of the best the Italian pairs. Vice Admiral's flag on the leader. Mm-hmm. The Cincini, perhaps. A Pugetti. The big eight inches, nearly on range now. Probably open fire any moment. Our sixties couldn't put a shell within 3,000 yards of them now. They know their superior strength. Undoubtedly been informed about us from the air. Possibly that's a screen out there for a stronger force. More heavy cruisers, perhaps, and battle ships. <laughs> Why should they wait for reinforcements? Two heavy cruisers and four light against our five light cruisers. If they know their business, they'll turn to port, close with us, and finish us off. If we knew ours, we would run like hares. Let the convoy go. Let Malta go. Later, the captain's report read, At 1310 hours, the enemy opened fire. It might be worth someone's while to try to analyze why the column of water thrown up by an eight-inch shell should be so beautiful. It possesses a faint yellow tinge, meaning it's of the high explosive type, and it's really a charming sight against sky and sea. They're beautiful to watch as long as they miss, and these powerful, all-destructive eight inches were all distinct misses, showing that the gunnery control instruments in the Italian ship were not lined up as accurately as they should be. Now the British flagship was leading round to the enemy. That was the way to deal with them. If they won't come out and fight, go in and fight them. Range one seven double O. Range one seven double O. It was leading seaman Alfred Lightfoot's job to take ranges quickly. That was his personal contribution to the perfect fighting hole, which was the ship. And he did what he was supposed to do without distraction. Blimey, if a shell's got me name on it, I'll get it, and from no other shell. Twenty-one seconds ago, he'd seen the flashes of the guns at which he was pointing his rangefinder, and already Alfred Lightfoot had forgotten them. During those twenty-one seconds, those eight-inch shells had been hurtling towards the HMS Artemis, hurtling through the air at a speed of more than a mile in two seconds. Their path was curved, reaching far up into the upper atmosphere, higher than the highest Alps, into the freezing stratosphere before plunging downward towards their target. Suddenly, Alfred Lightfoot heard a noise as of rushing water and of tearing sheets. And then the field of his rangefinder was blotted out in an immense upheaval of water as the nearest shell of the broadside pitched close beside the starboard bow of the ark. Twenty tons of yellowed water came tumbling on board, deluging the upper works, flooding over Lightfoot's rangefinder. Nine hop Stewart! Oh! Instantly, training and professional pride mastered him, and he deftly twirled the screws and brought the enemy into focus once again. Nine, one, nine, double O. It was then that Paymaster Sub Lieutenant James Jerningham saw the Italian ship turn away, and he gravely noted the time upon the pad in his lap. Later, the captain's report read The enemy withdrew. Was it a surprise to you they're running away like that? No, sir. Not very much. It may just be a trick to get us away from the convoy. Then their planes would have a chance. But I don't think so. No, sir. There's something bigger than cruisers out today, I fancy. They might be trying to lead us into a trap. Stop at 15. Review and previous We're course. staying between the Aitais and the convoy. 
every minute brings us nearer to Malta. Jerningham at that point said, yes, sir. He was frantically searching about in his mind for some contribution to make to this conversation other than yes, sir, or no, sir. Wanting to appear bright, he said, night is coming. Yes. The eye are losing time. The most valuable asset they have, and they're squandering it. The commonest mistake to make in war is to think that because a certain course seems to you to be the best for the enemy, that is the course he will take. He may not think it best, or there may be some reason against it which you don't know about. That's true, sir. This was the longest speech ever heard from the captain. And the next commonest mistake is to give unnecessary orders. Whipple up there. Ordinary seaman Whipple was now climbing the difficult ladder to the crow's nest to relieve Quimsby. Whipple up there will keep a sharp lookout without my telling him. He knows what he's there for. Jerningham gaped at him, wordless now in spite of his efforts to appear bright. This was an aspect of the captain's character which he'd never seen before. This courteous gentleman with his smiling common sense and his insight into character. When Whipple took over from Quimsby, aloft, and that thing in the front of the line is the flagship. Give my regards to the Admiral when you get your commission. Go on, take your rest. Five minutes later, there was no kidding around. Four bridge. Masted, more smoke visible on the port bow, beyond the enemy cruisers. Red 3-8. Masted, more smoke visible. Masted, that lot of new smoke is closing us. Sign Baron. No, no. Red 3-9. Masthead. Battleship in sight. Two battleships in the Navy cruiser. Heading a little abaft of our Baron as the other ship... The other ships are turning now astern of them. The behavior of the ship's company was most satisfactory. Another phase of the captain's report. Not one man in ten in Artemis could see what was going on. In the captain's opinion, distorted news was dangerous. Go down and tell the ship about the situation. Aye, aye, sir. Jerningham's mind was feverishly turning over words and phrases as he descended the ladder. He didn't have time to assemble any. But on the other hand, he didn't have time in those few seconds to become self-conscious. Nor had his weakness time to reassert itself. I have a message for the ship from the captain. The petty officer beside the loudspeaker hanging on the bulkhead switched on and piped shrilly. Sound of his call audible in every part of the ship. The captain has sent me to tell you that we've got the entire Aikai Navy in front of us. Battleships, heavy cruisers and all. They've run away from us once, the heavy cruisers have. Now we're going to see if the battleships will run too. Three hours of daylight left and the convoy's got to reach Malta. Good luck to us all. There's none like us. Revolutions for 31 knots. Make smoke. Three minutes of smoke meant a smoke bank a mile and a half long. Far too wide for the enemy to watch with care all along its length. Later, the captain's report. I found the smoke screen to be extremely effective. The smoke bank allowing for spread would be a quarter of a mile thick. The captain had solved a complex mathematical problem in his head. He turned to the voice tube beside him. Captain, gunnery officer. Gunnery officer. I'm turning to starboard now. It will take us two minutes and ten seconds approximately to go through the smoke. You'll find the eye ties about red five when we come out. But I shall turn to port parallel to their course immediately. Open fire when you are ready. All right? Yes, sir. And by guns. Turn eight points to starboard, quartermaster. Of it. Fifteen. Hit it. Hit it. Stop making smoke. And the order went down through five decks to stoker petty officer Harmsworth in the boiler room. Now the Artemis was heading squarely into the smoke, solidly away to starboard. One moment they were out in that clear sunshine, and the next they were in reeking, oily darkness. Call the masthead and see if the lookout is in the smoke. Masthead reports he's in the smoke and can't see anything, sir. 50 seconds. 55 seconds. One minute. 75 seconds. 90 seconds. 105 seconds. Not long to go now, and the smoke was just as thick as ever. Extremely good. Two minutes. The captain could see the navigating lieutenant plainly now. 
and the Italians could just about see the shadowy gray form of the Artemis emerging from the smoke. 415. And Artemis, beautiful in the sunshine, swung round to turn her broadside upon that colossal force. Long before the Artemis emerged, however, the gunnery lieutenant had given order, All guns, look! This took only 15 seconds to accomplish. Therefore, when broadsides was affected and the last gun-ready lamp came on, it needed only one word to throw a quarter of a ton of steel and high explosive from one ship moving at 31 knots to another ship moving at 20 knots, nine miles away. Open fire! Open fire! Later, the captain's report read, what observed. Up! 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 Twelve shells were in the air at once, while the fountains raised by the six preceding ones still hung poised above the surface. Every ten seconds, the guns were ready and loaded, and every ten seconds, the shells were hurled out of them. Four hits with six broadsides was good shooting, and the Italian Navy was firing back straight at Artemis now. There were bright flashes all down the line, and sea and air were flung into convulsion. Ah! On the bridge, the sudden crash of the gun made Jerningham jump. It always did. He hoped none of the men on duty up here had seen him jump. The second time, he was sure his feet had left the deck. The din was appalling, and with every broadside, he was shaken by the hot blast of the gun. The captain gave an order to the navigating lieutenant, and soon HMS Artemis healed and turned abruptly away from the enemy and back into the comforting smoke. In darkness and silence. Captain, gunner there. Gunnery officer. We should be opening fire again in two minutes. And Artemis was already healing over on the turn as she plunged back into the smoke screen to seek out her enemies once more. One minute. Every man of the ship knew that the better he did his work now, the better would be his chance of life. Five seconds. Two minutes. Guns ready. Open up! Open up! Oh! And the above torque roared its tons of steel again toward the eye tide. Artemis was shooting superbly. The captain could see that with his own eyes as he turned his binoculars upon the Italian flagship. The enemy salvos were creeping closer. It was nearly time to retire again. A mile away, another British ship, HMS Hera, had emerged from the smoke screen, spitting fire from all her turrets. With Hera out of the screen and the other cruisers beginning to show beyond her, it was for Artemis to withdraw and leave the Italians to their weary task of getting the range on these new elusive targets. Fort 10! And Artemis plunged back into the protecting smoke. Then it happened. Salvos had been fired at Artemis without scoring a hit. Now, when she was invisible in the smoky fog, a chance shell hit her. It was an eight-inch shell that hit the cruiser. It struck the ship's side a yard above the waterline, and it penetrated the main deck as it burst, flinging red-hot fragments of steel all around it. And with the fragments came the flame of explosion. The X-gun turret bore the brunt. The officer at the shell ring and the officer at the ammunition hoist killed by the jagged steel. One minute they were alive, and the next, they were dead. One moment they were men, and then the shell burst right in their midst, and they were nothing. Nothing. The petty officer in charge of the lobby and the others survived them only by a few seconds. They died by fire, but it was a quick death. Ship's on fire aft, sir. Yes? Pretty badly, apparently, sir. Very good, Jerningham. Oh, thank you. One turret was out. The A and B turrets were firing away beautifully, all four guns in white-hot action. At that moment, a shell was fired from HMS Artemis, which changed the face of the war, altered the whole history of the world. Men and women in Nigeria or Czechoslovakia would feel the impact of that shell upon their lives. Headhunting cannibals in Papua, Siberian nomads seeking a scant living on the frozen tundra of Asia, Toddling babies in the cornfields of Iowa, and their children's children, would all in years to come owe something to that shell. Of the four shells fired in that salvo, three of them missed. The fourth, the shell from the left hand gun in turret A, hit. Later, the captain's report read The enemy turned away 
and the action terminated. That shell hadn't done any particular damage when it hit the Italian Majesty's battleship Lignano, but the dual Italian-German command of Stain, Capitan Sursay Helmut von Bordica and Vice Admiralio Gaspara Gaetano Nocentini were hesitating about what to do with a pesky little British ship. And they were arguing, politely, of course, on points of strategy. Also, they were suspicious of one another. And, well, you know how it is with the Italians and the Germans. The main thing is that when that historical six-inch shell struck full upon their B turret and burst against the 12-inch steel, it became the deciding factor that tipped down the scale and swayed the balance of von Bordica's and Nocentini's hesitating minds. The enemy turned away, and the action terminated. The enemy's out of range, sir. Thank you, Gunn. I believe I saw a torpedo hit on the second ship while you were speaking, sir. Thank you. Congratulations, sir. Thank you, Jernigan. There was only the faintest glow to be seen of the fire that had raged minutes before. And a few more minutes with the hose would extinguish even that. The ship emerged into the fading dust, for it was now beginning to grow dark. Then the captain suddenly tensed himself as his roving eye caught sight of a twinkle of light ahead. And then he was able to relax and even smile a little to himself in the twilight. For that was the evening star shining out over the Mediterranean. All hands dark on ship. Second degree of readiness. <laughs> the captain could now light his pipe, could now, inwardly only perhaps, relax. He could now afford to indulge in the luxury of quiet thought. This long struggle will someday have an end, I suppose, but not now, and not for months and years to come. And even when it does end, the freedom which the struggle will win can only be secured by eternal vigilance, eternal probity, eternal goodwill, and eternal honesty of purpose. That will be the hardest lesson of all. Peace will be a severer test of mankind than war. Perhaps mankind will pass that test when the time comes. As for me, when that time comes, I will fight to the last. Die in the last ditch before I will compromise in the slightest with the blind or secret enemies of freedom and justice. <laughs> the seventh program of Words at War, a series based on the great books of this war. This evening we presented The Ship by C.S. Forrester. The script was written by Edmund Bernbrier of the NBC script staff. Next week you'll hear Robert St. John's book From the Land of Silent People. The narrator tonight was played by Alan Bunch. House Jameson was the captain. Other members of the cast were Victor Beecroft, Sid Cassell, Humphrey Davis, Ian McAllister, Shirley Oliver, and Alfred Shirley. The original music was written and conducted by Frank Black. The production was under the direction of Joseph Losey. This program has been presented in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime for the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company.